morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. All right, okay. I can hear myself. I was going to ask if you could hear me, but I can hear myself. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's first session. We'll start by uh, acknowledging country. So I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as traditional custodians of the lands uh, upon which we meet today and recognize any other people or families with connection to the, uh, the lands of the ACT and the region. Uh, I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders, past and present uh, and emerging and any indigenous people who are with us uh, today. Right, welcome everyone to uh, the first session today. We're talking about um, how managers can contribute to localization. And this uh, session isn't sitting in isolation. Uh, if you'd heard uh, Deputy Prime Minister Prasad's uh, opening remarks yesterday, I think those were really some very, I, I found some very insightful uh, remarks from him. I particularly liked the point he made, um, I think around uh, that if development isn't locally led, is it really development? Uh, so I think that's a really good question for us to be thinking about uh, as we uh, start the morning. Uh, we won't take up too much time um, with the, you know, before we get started with the individual uh, presentations. Um, but I think what's really fascinating this morning is the dialogue between managing contractors who are an integral part of the development uh, cooperation uh, ecosystem. So we'll be looking at the question of locally led development, uh, recognizing that there are two sides to every story. Uh, we'll be bringing together different dimensions, uh, really looking at a contestation of ideas and having discussions at different places and levels uh, about this work. Uh, and then we'll be facilitating discussions to really get people involved in, uh, in the discussion this morning. So uh, I'll introduce our panel very quickly. Uh, so to, our, to my far left, we have uh, Jocho. So Jocho is uh, head of program quality and gender with DT Global. Uh, and prior to this, Joe worked with Ozaid and DFAT uh, on development programs. Uh, to my immediate left is Fareen Karoom, uh, director for scholarships and skills portfolio at Palladium. Uh, she was previously senior program development specialist for Ozaid. Uh, to my immediate, sorry, my apologies, USAID. My dyslexia is kicking in. Uh, to my immediate right, uh, Anne-Marie Rerink. Uh, Anne-Marie is speaking on Graham's behalf. Uh, he's uh, lost his voice, hopefully temporarily. Uh, Anne-Marie leads Ab's work on JETSI in the region. Uh, she'll do her best to decipher Graham's scribbles uh, when there are questions later on that are directed towards him. Uh, and finally, Graham Tiski, who needs no introduction. Uh, he's currently governance advisor in Ab since 2015, and before that was uh, governance principal sector specialist within DFAT. All right, so we'll get started this morning, uh, and we'll start with, uh, with Anne-Marie, who was speaking for Graham, and then we'll move on to Joe and uh, Farine. But before we hand over, yeah, so we're starting with uh, this, this first slide to really talk about the, the fact that there are two sides to the story. And we're looking at uh, the question of locally led development through the lens of, of, of or through three elements. Uh, we're looking at people, culture, and incentives. So really looking at that for uh, managing contractors as well as the, the arguments for and against locally led development. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Good. Good morning, everyone. Um, First up, I want to um, clarify that um, as we do these presentations, brief presentations, we are speaking on a personal note and we are not necessarily representing our company's viewpoints. Um, so as I go through the presentation, if I slip to we, I, Graham, it's all Graham basically. <laughs> So there's an interesting um, thread through a number of the discussions on locally led development last year as well as this year, and that is that there seems to be a lot of applause um, when we hear from local team leaders. Um, and that seems to be for extolling the virtues of having a local team leader. The question that then therefore arises, is having a local team leader the best we can do? We've already heard from other speakers that there are many different definitions on locally led development or localization, but two elements stand out for Graham. 
One is the transfer of power and authority to local individuals, organizations, and actors. And the second one is an increased and increasing use of local systems and processes. So let's do a thought experiment. Let's run through all the steps that a donor, such as, but not only, one not far from here, goes through in taking eight decisions. So as I go to the next slide and go through it, shout out at the point you think power and authority is transferred, or when you judge local systems and processes are being used. Which countries should receive ODA? How much to allocate to each? Which sectors to invest in? Which subsectors? Funding among sectors? Investment ideas? Authorization of investment concept notes? Approval of those concept notes? Drafting investment design document terms of references? Selection of the design team? Investment options? I'm still not hearing anything, by the way. <laughs> Investment modality, approval, selection of the managing contractor, negotiation of contract, establishment of the managing contractor's office, selection of national staff, choice of team leader, terms and conditions of local staff. I'm looking around, still no hands. Preparation of the annual work plan and budget, implementation of six months. Ah, okay, good, good. Implementation of the six-month plan, reporting, midterm review, end of program evaluation. So that was a pretty slim uh, selection of hands that I saw there and what I heard from you. So as we're looking at incentives for and against localization, I think this list is quite telling Against, there's plenty of reasons, and I think we have heard some of these being discussed already during previous panels. Um, for a donor, it has to do with national interest, reporting, national legislation, obligations. Um, for a managing contractor, um, promoting growth, protecting jobs, increasing profitability, protecting reputation. The incentives for localization, well, you see what Graham's take on it is here. So, Graham says, you may think me cynical. If so, you would be correct. <laughs> but he says, and this is a quote from Julian Bajini, who is a British philosopher. Um, Cynicism is a greater force for progress than optimism. The optimist underestimates how difficult it is to achieve real change, believing that anything is possible, and it's possible now. Only by confronting head-on the reality that all progress is going to be obstructed by vested interests and corrupted by human venality, can we create realistic programs that actually have a chance of success? And Graham has brought the book with him. It's called How the World Thinks. And he says it's required reading for anyone working cross-culturally. So you go and see Graham afterwards if you want to have a closer look at that book. So this is one side of the debate. I'm handing over to Joe at this stage. So that was a bit of a downer. <laughs> um, I'm hoping to present a slightly more optimistic perspective. So I think it's useful for us to firstly think about the context in which this whole discussion around locally led development is taking place. And uh, I want to take you through why I think it's a new context. I know that in the past we have talked about ownership, alignment, harmonisation, sustainability. Those concepts are not new. But I think there is a new element to the discussion we're having now about locally led development, localisation and decolonising aid. So just very quickly taking you through. I mean, a key part of this context is Black Lives Matter, the anti-racism movement that has swept across the world, and we have to remember that that is part of the discourse. There is that thing that happened to us all three years ago, a global pandemic, that really did fundamentally um, disrupt the way that 
business as usual happens in the development sector. And I don't think we can underestimate the impact that that had, but also the opportunities that that created in our thinking. We also have ESG and an increasing expectation and appetite for companies and corporates and private actors to be engaging with social and environmental issues. And this is going to make me sound really old, but we have a generational shift in thinking. And so the thinking, the values of younger generations is impacting on and influencing how we're thinking about these issues as well. So this is the context in which we're now looking at this issue of locally led development. So what are the donors saying? Let's just remind ourselves of this. And we did um, touch on this yesterday with uh, Kirsten Hawke talking about the OECD DAC definition. And it is about shifting and sharing power. And DFAT is talking about locally led development being a powerful means of leveraging Australia's development assistance. FCDO is talking about locally led development as the right thing to do. And USAID is talking about how locally led development will shift leadership away from itself. So I think the really interesting thing about this language that we're seeing from donors is that it is explicitly about power. It's acknowledging who holds power now and who needs to hold the power in the future. It is talking about a fundamental shift. So I think that is a really powerful and different nature of discussion that we're having right now. So in all of this, where do managing contractors sit? What have managing contractors got to do with it? So I thought I would talk a little bit about what drives managing contractors, and maybe this will be an interesting discussion. The first thing I will say is that if you look at the people on this panel and many of the people sitting around this room, the people that work for and work with contractors are people that care about development. That's why we are all doing it, that's why we're all here, that's why we're all talking about this. Now contractors have to make money. Contractors and companies have to be profitable to continue to exist. And a corollary of that is that Contractors need to, as, as a fundamental part of business, um, meet the expectations of the client. The client is the one that pays the bills and that's the donor. So there's no question that, that, is, that they are the fundamental drivers of, of contractors. But in that context, given that donors are now saying locally led development is a priority, it's a policy priority, um, it is being um, integrated into strategies and thinking and systems. This means that contractors are now incentivized to make locally led development a reality and make it happen. So th this is the positive, positive side of what we see happening now. So ultimately contractors exist to contribute to development outcomes and as we heard yesterday, if it's not locally led, it's not development. So my point is that contractors are actors with agency in the system and there are decisions that contractors make every day as part of doing their work that they have agency over and they can, they can make those decisions in a way that contribute to locally led development or they cannot. The choice is there. I don't think that any of us can pretend that we don't have any level of agency in what we're doing. So those are all, those are just an example of some of the ways that we can be starting to think about locally led development as a, a key framework within which we are making these everyday decisions. You can make decisions that progress and further locally led development or, or you might not. So I think that there's never really been a better time than now to be advancing locally led development. It is a policy priority and a commitment, so the authorising environment is now there. The door is open, as we heard yesterday from DFAT, for ideas, for strategies, for approaches, even for suggestions of what needs to change, what needs to be reformed. I don't want to pretend that we are already there, we're not. We are hearing about fantastic examples of where it is happening and it's wonderful to hear about those examples. Yesterday we heard from BCEP and Scala and Inclusi, 
from Balance of Power. In the past, we've heard about Vanuatu Skills Partnership. These are all amazing examples where it's already happening and it's really important to acknowledge that and learn from it because it shows us what's poss possible. But the reality is these are still the minority of cases. It's not, it's not the norm. And what we are embarking on a journey, we're probably only 10% maximum on, on our way there. We're embarking on a big transformation. And I don't want to pretend it's, it's going to be easy. I don't want to pretend that everyone's on board with it. That's not the case. And there are vested interests, and there are people that don't agree with it, and there are people that will stand in the way. But I think that the opportunity stands before us and it's up to us to take it. And what we really wanted to do today was to start breaking this down, getting beyond theory and actually starting to talk about some of those practical issues and some of those practical steps that we could all be thinking about and taking. What are they? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? So we've broken it up into thinking about three topics, people, culture and incentives. I'm going to hand over to Farheen to take us through those. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Anne-Marie and Graham and Penny. People. So, as we said earlier in the presentation, we are framing locally-led development under overarching three elements. That's people, culture and incentives. Um, Joe has set the scene in terms of where we are. I just wanted to go through the, the affirmatives, the positives and the negatives when we look at people from an LLD lens and from a managing contractors lens. Now with people, we've known this for a while and as, as we've seen yesterday and we'll see more today, there's a lot of great people, great local team leaders in different programs across the world, not just DFAT funded, USAID funded, FCDO funded, but the progress has taken a while. And we, we are here today to go through some of the structural, structural implementation and operational issues that we think about when we talk about LLD. So on the affirmatives, <coughs> managing contractors, now that we've got a policy, we've got a mandate, we can use our position and resources and be purpose, purpose, purposive and responsive to make sure that we use them to mentor development leaders. This is the time to innovate and champion pathways for national leaders. We need to, we as in managing contractors, would need to make deliberate and conscious choice to ensure that local people are in senior roles and that they are the ones making the decisions and they are the ones who are making the difference. Now that we know local team leaders, local solutions, local practices are important, this is also the time for us to look at our HR practices, our policies, and tweak the system so that it caters to the national systems so that we are able to attract and retain local talents. Now on the negatives, usually local senior roles come with some expectations and the expectation is that you will come with some international experience, perhaps some experience working with DFAT or working for a DFAT program, but that's hard to find. If you want to build local talent, you may not have someone with all those experiences, then what do you do? That is a big question and then I think it very much sits with us in terms of building that leadership. The other point is that jobs are focused on meeting donor requirements and it comes with not so sexy things such as reporting, commonwealth procurement, guidelines, public diplomacy and sometimes they are just not attractive enough to get the high level local talents in the role. We also know that, and we want to, and we will, and we are committed to making sure that there's equity and fair pay for all. So that means remunerating your locals and your internationals at the same level. 
But what it does is that it does, we do acknowledge that it distorts the market. And what it means is that local talents are often taken away from national roles, national government roles, and private sector. And then on WFM, sadly, sometimes the value for money proposition does not go too well when there's time and resource limits in contracts. And client is often unwilling to invest on professional development, especially when there's an end date to a contract. So these are the positives and negatives of people. We'll hear more when we open the floor. I will now go to the second debate on culture. Culture is big. We know that integrating cultural awareness is critical to locally-led development. As managing contractors, as service providers with the LLD lens, we can create an inclusive space for staff to test their unconscious biases and how it may play on the work front. So for example, this includes who speaks in a meeting, and we know power dynamics play, we know gender plays. We know that sometimes in a room, men would talk and women would take the back seat, but that's part of the culture. We also know language plays. I've been in meetings where the whole room is speaking in one language, in Tamil, in Sri Lanka, and the Sinhalese are, the two Sinhalese are feeling quite isolated. But that is where we can play a role and we can introduce process and systems to ensure that it's an inclusive space and that we are able to unpack culture in a, in a way that is not disrespecting culture. Managing contractors can be an enabling contractor and work more towards inclusive practices that celebrates and incubates local leadership and local solutions. This means reading the political economy, picking up the pulse, understanding the gender roles, and see all the different dimensions that it comes to play. And we want to make sure that the local leadership is, is positioned to make decisions that is fit for purpose. We're not trying to bring a design, a concept from the Western and asking them to implement here. So we want to work within the grain. Managing contractors in a support contract structure and model can also be a useful outsider. And I've learned that from the Vanuatu Skills Partnership team. And I've been told that, you know, be the useful outsider. We don't have to be, we don't have to know everything. We should take a back seat, observe, and learn what has worked, why it has worked, and then try to use those knowledge to implement for an effective program. But there's a flip side to this. And on the negative, sometimes it is not in the interest of the contractor to create disharmony within their teams as they try to unpack culture because it gets complex and it gets risky, especially when everyone is busy and everyone is trying to implement a program within a certain time frame. Another risk is increasing competition now that we are on the hunt for local talent, building talent, identifying talent, getting solutions. It does have a risk of non-collaboration because it's competitive. I will go to the next and the last slide for our incentives, the third dimension on this debate on LLD, locally led development. So now that we've got a dev development policy that reiterates its commitment to locally-led development and also some indicators, three-tier performance framework where there's specific LLD indicators. It's measuring number of local personnel, subcontractors, local staff engaged. There's also an ambition that by 2026, 80% of bilateral investment designs and evaluations include local participation. So what it really means is that the onus is really on us to make sure that we impress the client, we impress, impress our donors, 
and we will do everything to make sure that they are impressed. Contractors will innovate, contractors will embrace creativity, and we will do, er we, as in contractors, will try to do everything to bring effective solutions to exceed the expectation of the policy. Now, the other positive side of the incentives is that managing contractors who will want to demonstrate and foster long-term sustainable outcomes is doing it for a purpose. Because at the end of the day, we do want to see sustainable change. We do want to see growth in our people and the communities. It's not just strategic. It's not just about you know, reputation building or being um, you know, forward thinking approach. It's about the greater good. The other side of the story, well, in some programs we have activity managers who are dealing with a lot of priorities and uh, locally led development may not be their priority. What do we do then as a managing contractor when that is not the priority of our activity manager? The other dilemma is that the new development policy has lots of priorities. We've got the gender priority, we've got disability, equity and rights. There's also climate change with so many priorities and so many you know, achievements and outcomes that we need to demonstrate. Sometimes we are in a tight spot and we want to go after the biggest bang for our buck and that may not be locally led development. It all depends on the time, it all depends on the funding. And the last part is an important one. Unless our client changes the mechanism, the modality on how we deliver and how these head contracts are structured and the compliance requirements that go with it, the deadlines of the milestone, the, the performance payments payment by results, Managing contractors don't really have the luxury of time at times to meaningfully engage, to pause and reflect on the local context because we are on a rush. We are on a rush to deliver in a certain timeline as prescribed in the contract. And so the big trade-off is then for speedy implementation versus local tailoring of interventions that could take a long time. And now, the big debate, localization. Is it blue sky or is this the future of aid? I will now pass it to Penny. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Thoreen. Thanks, Joe. And uh, thanks, Anne-Marie, for Graham. So we've had some really interesting uh, discussions uh, already this morning. I mean, I, I think there are... Uh, Particularly the framing around people, culture, incentives, I think, is quite interesting. Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, having a mandate, having talent, resourcing, versus international experience that are required. That's required uh, donor compliance and potentially skewing the market. And culture, we're talking about the dynamics of power, gender, language, uh, contractors as enablers, versus your managers just being too busy. You're implementing, reporting, planning, uh, and then there's culture how much time do, can actually take to do uh, to really be working in a culturally contextualized way. And then finally, I think, which is really an important point uh, around incentives, uh, you know, that managing contractors can, can work according to donor policies and priorities, recognize these lead to long-term sustainable outcomes. I mean, I've, uh, adaptive leadership talks about the fact that if you're doing the same thing over and over and you're not fixing anything, you need to fundamentally shift the way you work. Um, and then, you know, uh, locally led development not being a priority, and then so many different policies that you're having to work towards. So I think there's some really ripe ground there for some discussion. Uh, we'd like to open the floor now for uh, questions, uh, and just a note that if you're asking a question for Graham, uh, he will we'll need to come back to that at some stage a little later on. We'll give him a few minutes to, to make some notes. Okay, so are there any uh, questions? Thank you. Thank you for those fabulous insights. Ollie May from Deloitte. Um, it was interesting to, to hear the perspective around uh, local staff. 
Um, but unless I missed it, I didn't hear any references to working with local partner organizations. Is that a fundamental challenge in the managing contractor model? And what are the uh, incentives for managing contractors to do that? Uh, yeah, we didn't explicitly talk about that, but that's absolutely part of um, that way of working, of locally-led development. I, I think that contractors are working with local partners all the time. Um, there are uh, now explicit focus and targets around increasing levels of um, partnerships with local businesses as service providers, as well as development actors, you know, particularly through grants to local organisations. So. I don't think that's anything new. We are looking at um, more of it, but I think we're also looking at increasing the quality of it so that it's not just about um, the donor and then the contractor sort of demanding a certain service or demanding certain outcomes. It's about working with those local partners to be empowering them in what they do and what they see as the priorities and how they want to operate. So I think that is a shift that is still happening. I think some programs are doing that really well. We heard yesterday from Inclusi, for example, and how it's working with uh, women's organisations and disability rights organisations. And I think we need to be learning from those experiences because really the role of the contractor there is being the intermediary between the donor with the donor requirements and the local actors with their objectives, their identity, their goals. So how do we mediate those in the best way possible that enhances and, and empowers those local actors? And again, I don't think it's, it's necessarily easy. There are challenges and there are areas that are, um, you know, we have zero tolerance of fraud and there are safeguards that need to be protected. So those are things that um, can't be um, necessarily reconciled all the time with those two objectives. So I think we do need to recognise it is um, a learning process. It would be really interesting to hear people's experience of this. A and there are times when those objectives will come into conflict, I think. Thank you for that question. As you would expect, Graham has prepared some notes about the other side of the argument. So he's saying that we work with local partners as agents not as true partners. We subcontract local organizations and take on the responsibility to fun for the financial oversight, etc. Uh, thank you. Um, just a couple of comments which um, I guess any of the panel can respond to. But I, I guess one thing that's probably worth I guess pointing out in terms of kind of the contradiction when it comes to the level of control that donors expect of programs is obviously the increasing use of budget support. And if you look at the, you know, the level or the contrast between the level of control expected around budget support, which is increasing as um, Biman Prasad pointed out yesterday and he welcomed that and he highlighted budget support as a powerful form of localization. Um, and programs, I mean, I, I just think it's a contradiction worth pointing out, you know, that, I mean, Western, like, not Australia, but Western donors are putting, you know, US billions of dollars through Ukraine's national budget as part of, you know, the support for Ukraine. Uh, and yet, when it comes to these smaller programs or mid-sized programs, uh, it's just amazing, you know, the level of control. You just contrast those two things. Um, yeah, secondly, just in terms of, I guess, getting license to um, step back from that level of control. I mean, I think the development partnership plans that are in train now might be a really good opportunity to actually have a discussion about what localization means at a country level and get beyond the kind of generalities that are in the development policy and say, well, what does localization mean in this country? So when um, Pat Conroy was here a few months ago, and talking about implementing the new policy, he laid out three challenges. The first was, how do we improve local partnerships? The second was, how do we make 
um, good decisions around priorities and what's going to get the best impact. And the third one was learning. And it's my view that actually those three challenges should structure the DPPs because the DPPs shouldn't just be a list of sectors or a list of things we may or may not do in the future and they'll probably, the DPPs could well be out of date very soon after they're written if we take that approach or they could just be platitudes. So I think, you know, getting some license around what localization looks like in a, in, in a particular country, um, you know, the DPPs could be a vehicle for that if they're used well. Thank you. And, and building in some learning around that, which was Conroy's, uh, one of Conroy's other challenges. But yeah, sorry, that's just a couple of comments. Welcome to respond or not. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it's a really interesting point on um, control on budget support. And we are seeing it uh, in one side of the world. And then when you look at really small contracts that have so much control over you know, what this 10 million is going to do and achieve in, in a certain small island in the Pacific. I think it all boils down to shifting of power and how much we're willing to let go of that control and power to the, to the local teams and the local programs. But along with that, I'll just really put on my practical lens on, I think there's, there has to be a commitment to build capacity and build and strengthen local organization and institutions to take over those decision-making roles. And uh, we can't just, you know, it, just because we have a policy now, transfer that, um, you know, power to a local org organization, we need to be also there to ensure that they understand what, the, what compliance means, they understand what safeguarding means, and, and to support them in understanding and uh, it could be training, it could be strengthening their capacity. On the DPP, I think it's a really, um, it's, it's great that each post is running their own DPPs, and then we've got the regional ones, but the DPP would probably set the stage on what localization or locally led development would look like for that specific country, because we all know it's not one size fit, fit all, so it needs to look different from one country to another, and we look forward to what, what comes out of the DPP. I think on budget support, um, we all have to remember the balancing act of the need to safeguard the existence of Australian aid in the first place. That's a constant battle in the Australian political system um, with the benefits of budget support, and I think I mean, I've been involved in a, a long-term engagement and program where there was sectoral budget support, um, and that was a really important and effective way of supporting the ownership of, of the government partners we were working with, and it was aligned to their priorities and got using their systems and, and strengthening those systems as it was being used with support around it, all of that. And then there was a very significant fraud, and it all stopped. And it had significant impacts, not just on that program, but every program. I won't mention the, the program. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. But I think it just goes to show that it is a balancing act. Yes, budget support can be effective, but it needs to still be effective. It can't just be pumping millions of dollars into a system that's not then delivering outcomes for people on the ground. So I don't think that we can get carried away with budget support as, as the answer um, necessarily. Uh, but it would be great to see more of it where, where it's feasible. Um, I think in terms of DPPs, um, it is really interesting. We are starting to engage in some of the discussions on DPPs and it's really good that this thinking is happening. Um, it's really that overarching strategic view of what is it that we're trying to support or do or achieve or be in any particular country or context. I think in terms of locally led development, the most important thing the DPP could do is provide that political economy analysis, that understanding of the lay of the land of that particular country, who are the reformists, where are the biggest opportunities to create change, who are the actors that we should be backing. And I think that if we do see that in DPPs, that's going to go a long way to help shape uh, our strategies going forward for locally led development for all of us.
This is a lot more challenging than I had anticipated. <laughs> hmm. How can we, with a straight face, claim to be promoting locally led development when the starting point of Australian aid, and now UK aid too, is promoting our own national interests? Could someone please provide a answer? I have in mind an ex defat Depsec in the room. Would uh, <laughs> it's a safe space. <laughs> yeah. Safe-ish. Uh, hi, uh, my name's James Batley, <laughs> and I'm from the ANU. <laughs> but I, I did want to ask the panel, I, yes, I, is there a sort of basic incoherence between the idea of the aid program as a tool of statecraft, and, and the Foreign Minister talks freely about shaping our region in light of our interests, and and locally led development. And I wonder, is the sector really cherry picking this idea and saying this is the core of the new international development policy when, I don't know, is it? Um, so, if there is that tension, let's agree there's a tension, what would your advice be to DFAT on how to resolve it? I suppose is the constructive way to, to think about that, that tension. could just keep pinging this question around the room to different people to answer. Uh, I agree it's a tension. Um, I, and, and that's why I say we're, we're at the beginning of a journey and we don't know where that journey is going to go and in some places it's not going to go anywhere because of that tension. I think that is the reality. Where I put up that DFAT is saying locally led development is a, is a way of leveraging Australian development assistance... I mean, what I hope that means is that Australia does see locally led development as part of its national interest in how it engages as a development partner because it is what Deputy Prime Minister Biman Prasad wants. It is what the leaders of the Pacific want. It's what the local actors want. So if we are responding to that demand, if we are working as genuine partners, if we are showing through our actions, not just our words, that we are respecting that and we are supporting and enhancing that leadership, not coming in as the heavy-handed donor with all the answers, that is in our national interest. I acknowledge, though, that that's not always going to be seen to be the case and there are going to be uh, areas where there are priorities that donors just want to make happen and get done. Um, but I think that is why this emphasis on the how, which is part of the international development policy and, in, and is part of the DPPs, is really important. It's not these documents anymore <coughs> defining the what and saying this is what needs to be done and this is what we're going to do. It is about how we work and there is an emphasis on that as a principle. There is measurement around that and there are incentives around that. So I think that's the really important bit of regardless of what the issue is and what's, what we're trying to get done, the how is important and the more we focus on that, the better it's going to be in terms of respecting locally led development as a way of working. I just want to add something else to the tension. I mean, we are working in a region that's quite small and there are other actors and actors such as we've got other donors like USAID, China, other players that are now becoming big. And I think it is 
definitely of uh, national interest to make sure that we are in partnership with all these countries that we call friends and partners. But we need to be strategic in terms of what is what is the sector that, that supports the partner government, the partner countries and the people. Um, and hopefully the DPP will be able to identify the areas that best supports those national interests and also aligned with the national interest of uh, Australia. So Graham is not just a cynic, but he's a pragmatist as well. He says, I think detention cannot be resolved. We have to work on national interest and locally led development at the same time. We must recognize detention. And this may mean starting from the bottom of that list that we showed on slide six and work our way up. We've got, got a couple of questions. So maybe we'll take a, we'll take a couple. Uh, the one from there and these two and then we'll, we'll answer those. Huh? Thank you. It seems like an awkward time to disclose that I'm from DFAT. Um, <laughs> my name's Liz Cowan. I'm from the Gender Equality, Disability and Social Inclusion Branch. Um, I completely agree with what you just said about that tension, but I mean, locally-led development, it's an approach, right? Like, it's not something that we do instead of doing gender equality. It's the way that we should be doing gender equality work. But I'm not here to, um, to give a lecture. Um, I do actually have a question. I have many questions. Um, so I really enjoyed the um, I really enjoyed your comments about culture, and it's interesting to hear about that kind of reflection and reckoning that's happening inside managing contractors at the moment. I previously worked for an INGO that was going through a similar process, um, and yesterday I enjoyed a, um, a presentation by a colleague from Save the Children talking about their approach to gender self-reflection within their organisation in Cambodia. And so I'm curious to hear if any of the managing contractors are going through similar um, like gender auditing or gender self-reflection processes. And um, Fahin, you, your um, point about the, um, the risk of distorting the market in terms of salary, I think is a very pointy issue and one that I would love to hear more about, noting that it's very sensitive. Um, so something that I am curious about is whether there's any discussion happening within managing contractors about reviewing the salary scales to better align with, um, with pay grades in country that wouldn't have those same distorting impacts. And then also, I'm just really aware that we're talking about locally led development and we haven't yet had any questions or contributions from any of our colleagues in the room who um, are, I assume, from the areas that we're talking about doing locally-led development in. So I would love to hear from some of them as well. We have two questions on here. Yeah, on this side. Thanks. Um, Mike Wolf. I'm independent, and um, one of my biases is um, throughout my career, I've been a cheerleader and operationalizer of locally-led development. And so I, I want to start off by saying thank you to each of the panelists for, for opening up discussion on, on this complex um, topic and for sharing your, your views. Um, so I have an observation and a question. My observation is, and um, the slide just disappeared, <laughs> but uh, even in the previous slide, so my observation is that one, <laughs> thanks. Uh, throughout the uh, presentation, there were a number of um, statements. Where, uh, I, I observed a number of ors. And we can even see it here, like localization, blue sky, or the future of aid. And I just felt that polarity. Like uh, there, there's a lot of phraseology around a polarity of either or. And I guess my, my question for each of the panelists, as you'd like to, if you'd like to engage in it, is what difference would it make for you if we replaced some of those ors with ands? If we said that localization is blue sky and the future of aid. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Fiona Taupi. I've recently started a, a new role as localization advisor to FCDO, so this is fascinating. <laughs> um, I wanted to go back to Cam's point um, around that decision, going back up the decision trail around investments. Um, and not, I mean, there's obviously the move of DFAT to look at budget support, but there's a whole raft of other investment mechanisms that are available um, to, you know, um, to donors. I'm looking at some of the country-based trust funds that FCDO run where the governance is radically different and um, 
some of the governance that, uh, that can actually put uh, women-led organisations in the decision-making seat and in the governance roles. There's a whole raft of um, investment mechanisms that we're not really touching on. It's a very broad spectrum. And so my question to the panel is, if you had recommendations around how we can actually uh, change the contracting model um, a little bit, <laughs> I'm not saying all the way into budget support, but he had two or three sort of practical recommendations back to DFAT about how we can actually change that, the, the current contracting model. Because I feel like about, you know, six or seven years ago, there were different models that DFAT was entertaining around changing, you know, um, an analysis of value for money and those sorts of milestone-based contracts. So, thanks. Thanks. So, uh, we've got a question on um, gender auditing or self-reflection. Uh, MC reviewing, uh, managing contractors reviewing salary scales. Uh, what difference would it make the polarity yeah, to say and rather than or? And then recommendations to default on changing contracting models. So who would like to start? I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and with Graham's permission answer Liz's question directly, <laughs> which I think is makes sense. Um, it's a really interesting question. Uh, there's a lot that can and should be done uh, to change the culture as was shown on the slide and uh, do greater self-reflection within teams. Um, in Apt Associates, we have models in each of our programs whereby our local staff um, get together regularly and talk about not just local culture, but also policy and practices um, from a JETSI perspective. And they are then empowered to propose changes that they think need to be changed. And this is very much part of our EDGE certification. The, um, certification um, around gender equality standards um, within our corporate culture. So it's, um, it's a model whereby we talk about the issues not from a headquarters perspective, but very much from the perspective of how policies and practices are shaped and experienced um, and um, how our local staff would like to see them go forward. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I'll, I'll speak a little bit on the salary distortion. So um, I think we, yes, it is distortion, but we, we are all here with the commitment to make sure that we have equitable and equity across all our programs. So even if it's for a short term, we should be able to give our local staff the same salary as the international, especially if they're bringing equal and every value, same value to the table. However, I mean, we do have um, two different clients that we are stakeholders that w th that's part of this dialogue. One is your local government, that's a stakeholder, and the other stakeholder is your uh, donor, so it could be DFAT or USAID. And usually the salary structure, all of that is dictated by the head contract, what's in it. As an organization in Palladium, we, we are constantly trying to go to post and rationalize to post why local staff should be remunerated at a certain scale within the framework of the, of the budget that's set in the head contract. So I think that then relates to the head contract, what is, what is established in the contract in the very beginning. I would say that um, you know, when we're doing new designs and when new projects are being um, starting up and implemented, one should do a market study, but one should also align it with what's being paid at an international level in that specific country. And if it's, again, if it's short term, let it be short term, but let's pay equally and equitably. I think um, on the question of culture and organizational culture, and it was really interesting yesterday uh, when Andrew Egan identified DFAT organisational culture as, as the most critical factor from his perspective. Um, and I think that's right. For all of us, the organisations we work in, the organisational culture is really key. Um, we have adopted, and I would recommend to you all, um, a really fantastic framework that was developed by my esteemed panel chair and many others in the room, Mariani, Jennifer, Fremden, Anna, uh, Yeshe, um, who developed a piece uh, called Yielding and Wielding. And it's about how 
we need to look at this from an individual, organisational and systemic perspective. I mean, every issue you can think of, you can break down into those three levels and think about what power you have that you can yield um, and think about the wielding of that power in a different way as well. So I think that's a really useful starting point, a, a really useful framework, and that's something that we've tried to discuss within our organisation and encourage different teams to be using that framework and discussing it as, as they um, take forward their work in, within individual programs as well. And I think just creating that space and, and creating a framework with, within which to have that discussion and um, offering facilitation of those discussions is a really important starting point. Um, in terms of salary, I definitely agree that this is, you know, this is an example of a very important issue that really goes to the heart of some of the equity issues that we're talking about, the, the value that we place on people and their work and their knowledge. Um, there's no bigger uh, expression of that than salary. So it is incredibly important. It's also incredibly difficult um, and our organisation has definitely been struggling with it. Um, we're trying to work through it on many different levels and in many different contexts. Um, I think that we need to acknowledge that it operates at individual organisational and systemic levels. I mean, our, our starting point is a system that for decades has assumed that it's internationals going into countries and being the experts and being paid at a high rate to do so and that local staff are not those experts. They're there to support or provide administration or logistics. And there's, there's a built-in inequity into the system that we started with. It's, it's uh, throughout the advisor remuneration framework. It's the way that contracts have been set up. So it's not as easy as an individual organisation going forth and changing all of that on its own. It does need to be a shift that happens at, at multiple levels. But I do think that uh, we are moving towards an environment where that can increasingly happen. So we have moved away from the ARF. Um, we are looking at organisations being able to set um, salary scales increasingly. So whilst we are starting with that as a starting point, it has sort of set the market, it has created certain expectations and it is how things work at the moment. There are shifts happening and I think that we contractors, DFAT, need to be working together with um, all of the actors to make that happen. Um, and we need to involve local actors in that discussion. Um, one of the things that we have done at DT Global is start uh, an emerging leaders program and many of the emerging leaders are in this room today um, and part of what they are thinking about and doing is giving us advice from their perspective and from their experience of what we need to be doing differently and one of those key things that, that has come up and continues to come up is around salary. So it is important that it is part of that engagement and discussion uh, with all of those different actors involved. Um, Mike, I think your <laughs> and and or question, I, I agree it is an and. Um, we are trying to, we were trying to frame it as, you know, there are two sides to the story and we want to gauge where people think we are in that journey. Um, and it's not linear and there are going to be areas of overlap or both or, you know, um, ambiguity. Um, I think that, I mean, my personal view is that we're around about 10% on the way there and that's optimistic. Um, but it'd be great to hear from others where you think we are now and how far we've got to go. Thanks, Joe. We have a question from... Uh So, a response from Graham to Fiona's question, which is a very good question. Uh, there are two issues here. One is the nature of the instrument, financial, there is technical assistance, for example, and the second is the modality. So, regarding instruments, budget support can be intensely localized, but often isn't, as the donor demands, separate reporting and auditing. So, in other words, it's a parallel account. And on modalities, DFAT prioritizes project implementation units managed by managing contractors. 
on the other hand, the World Bank doesn't. There are delivery options that utilize local systems to a greater extent, for example, embedded inside partner governments. Sorry, I forgot to answer your question, Fiona. I did want to say something about that. Um, how do we change, what changes could we make to the managing contractor model? Well, I, th I think to start with, not, not calling them managing contractors would be a good start. Um, I think we have got examples now. So uh, one that we've worked with is Pacific Women Shaping Pacific Development. If we look at that as an example of a, a 10 year, huge gender equality investment, 320 million, all through a contractor, which was us, um, and now the next phase of that program, largely because of demand from those actors and from the region for greater ownership and um, greater localization, is a completely different model. And the contractor is an enabling contractor. It, it's small, it has a very small and specific role. The main actors are SPC, a regional organization, the women's rights groups in the region, um, and UN and other bodies. So it's recognising that there, is, there are a plethora of actors, mainly local. There is a role for a, a contractor, but it's a supporting role, it's an enabling role, it's behind the scenes and it's small. I think that that's one of the fundamental shifts that could happen in terms of how the role of contractors are envisaged. Um, another great example, I think, is the Fiji Women's Fund. Uh, which was established and um, a contractor was asked to establish it, but it had to have a sustainability plan developed from within six months. It was one of the first things that needed to be designed and it needed to be become fully sustainable and fully local within five years. That was the mandate. Um, and so that happened and it's now a lo local entity. It's the Women's Fund of Fiji and it... Um, receives donor funds directly and disperses those to other local women's groups around the country and provides support and capacity building. So I do think that's a great model where it's considered upfront, the role of the contractor is explicitly worked out of the system um, within a set time frame and that's actually a goal, that's a measure of success for the contractor to be able to do that. Thanks, Jules. Sorry, before we come to the, uh, the question from uh, Petra, just a quick plug about the, the practice or the guidance note that uh, Anna Joubert and I and others wrote. It's called Decolonization and Locally Led Development. It's available on the ACFID website. Uh, and as Joe said, it looks at, it asks reflective questions on how you can begin to shift things in, in the environments you work in at the systemic, organizational, and personal level. My recommendation is to try and stay away from the systemic questions for a start, <laughs> because you abstract the discussion upwards. Uh, so to really start at the personal and organizational level, uh, and there'll be a degree of discomfort as you're, as you're going through those questions, and that's okay. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thanks, Petra. Thanks, Penny. Uh, just a comment and a question. First, I uh, found uh, Graham's question was really interesting in that I think there it is quite, quite uh, what, what was the word, um, uh, concilable in terms of, it, and to keep it short, just across three dimensions, if you're looking at uh, across power, principle, and purpose, definitely reconcilable across uh, purpose and principles, and then you can negotiate around the power, uh, power aspect. So, but I, I just feel that it's in this current age and the merging leadership that is, is we're not so much, uh, the merging leadership is not so much baggaged by colonization and, uh, and, and with so much, uh, enabling technology that uh, I think the emerging leadership is, is, is um, uh, we, we can find uh, uh, between various national, national interests the um, uh, 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 a strong alignment. So maybe it's just some of us were, maybe we've just been too long in the industry and, and so, um, and so the, moving to the question is uh, uh, how do you see as managing contractors in recruitment of teams the emergence of new leaders, and, and, and like you were saying, Joe, um, uh, within the emerging leadership uh, in development program, um, leaders that are not so, um, uh, more of our recruits are, and more of our development workers that are not so constrained and, and that, that can uh, progress the agenda in, in terms of both uh, Blue Sky and the future of, uh, future of aid. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, Selvi Vikan, NGO Programs and Partnerships section of DFAT. Um, it, it was interesting to hear the discussion of the tensions between national interest and locally led development. What I haven't heard is the tensions that may occur within the local ecosystem. So, for example, you know, I've been in situa uh, you know, a country context where there are a number of ethnic groups and if you have a ruling um, government with a certain high composition of, a, of an ethnic group, there might be expectations to roll out a national education curriculum, for instance, and then you have different ethnic groups that are trying to reconcile this national curriculum with their own sort of ethnic interests. But you are there at the, um, uh, with the permission of the national government. So there's always, you know, complexities within that local space and I just want to make sure we don't, we've sort of treated it as a dichotomy, national, local, but to really understand the tensions that lie within local and how to navigate within that space. So if you've had any experiences with that, it would be great to hear. So navigating the tensions and divergences within the local ecosystem. Thank you. Thanks. And there was, sorry, uh, just the last one at the right at the top there. Hi, my name is Prima from Alinea International and I think from, you know, yesterday I make a comment about how the, you know, DVEP programs are very much, um, you know, dominated with the, you know, reserving a top positions to the expatriate and just, you know, the inferior positions to the locals and we are celebrating the minority team leaders, which means there is a huge homework um, over the locally led development and you know, curious to know whether there is any tangible measurement that we all committed here just to see that it's progressing. You know, that's, I think as we talk and we talk, the discourses are still uh, maybe not making any change because we are always just celebrating the minority, uh, small achievements, rather than working towards the, you know, progress that we are intending to make. The other um, questions is actually on well, none of you discuss about the, you know, the profit-oriented <laughs> mechanism where reserving the top position for expatriates is much more profitable than, you know, putting the locals at the team leaders or top management priorities where that's actually helping the locals actually engage in meaningful reform. I think um, the, the questions over. Thanks. We'll start with uh, Graham to respond to Petra's question and move around. It. Well, it's actually a response to Sylvie's question. Um, Graham says, great point about ethnic tensions. In the early days of the PNG government facility, we recruited three or four very senior Papua New Guineans. They were excellent. However, at one meeting with a senior Papua New Guinean government official, I was told they were the wrong Papua New Guineans. Um, I'll just add a little bit to to that on the ethnic tensions. I've I've seen that with a few c programs, and one I share today is the Sri Lanka Skills Program, and um, the program started with uh, in the eastern provinces, which is predominantly Tamil dominated. And then after four years of implementation, uh, we went through an MTI and it became a national program. And suddenly we've been asked to move to Colombo and operate at a national level from Colombo as opposed to the eastern provinces. And here we are with, uh, with a large number of Tamil staff who will then need to be moved and mobilized to, to Colombo. And then now we are dealing with uh, national government, no longer the provincial government or the regional government. And there's been plenty of times we've sent our really senior managers from, from our team and there was just no traction. We're trying to get some skills, um, you know, ideas and uh, processes implemented, no traction from the government. They are not engaging, they are not giving us meetings. And soon we realized it's, it's that tension between the Sinhalese government and the Tamil government. This is a safe space, so I'm just saying that we understand that there are differences and there are different groups and communities that we're dealing with. 
as an organization, we had to go through a, a tremendous refresh of how our team would look like, who would be best positioned, who would then be responsible to engage with the government. And, um, and again, on locally led development, just lending a lens here, we just thought it was sometimes easier to send our white male team leader to have that conversation and to forge that partnership that we were trying to get from the partner government. It, it's not the best example, but it just goes to show that sometimes you, you do need to navigate through the structures. It's, it varies how you see locally led development from the Pacific lens, even within Pacific, Melani Melanesian, Polynesian to Micronesia, is quite different to how it is in South Asia. And, and as a woman with South Asia heritage, I have been in plenty of meetings where even having an authority and some kind of an authority, whether from USAID or from this organization, I was faced with, with just nothing. And it felt easier to just bring along a, a male um, colleague to have that, you know, to forge that discussion. And it worked. So I like to see it more like how do we, how do we use these different power structures, but sort of work within that. So it, I wouldn't say that locally led development is the gold standard and that's how it should be. We need to be very careful and conscious what works. And sometimes, ideally, that is what it should work. Um, I do want to talk uh, just briefly on minority and that we are celebrating the team leaders and our local leaders in the past couple of days. It is, it, it, we should celebrate. We have some really good examples from Vanuatu's partnership, from Scala to uh, Inclusi, other programs um, that has seen tremendous outcomes and results through the leadership of local teams. And, and there's a story behind it. It's not just the leaders, but it's also the systems and structures they are the ones who have influence to make sure that the systems, the budget systems or the finance systems, the recruitment systems are aligned to the local context. Yeah, I think just following on from that in terms of the, the team leader role, I think it's important that we're not just looking at keeping the team leader role and the team exactly as it is, but we're just filling those positions with local people instead of international people. It's about shifting what those teams and roles and responsibilities look like as well. Um, I think that even the, the role of the team leader, that is a donor creation and that is designed to serve the needs of the donor, that needs a reimagining. And so I think in the examples that we are hearing about from Vanuatu Skills, Inclusi, BCEP, Scala, so on, the reason that they are inspiring and the reason we need to learn is because it's not just old Petra's in that position or Fremden's in that position. It's they are fundamentally shifting and reimagining and re-navigating what the actual structure of that relationship looks like, what those teams look like and making it work for them in their context in order to be effective. So I think that's the exciting thing and that's what we, we need to be learning about and thinking about. And um, I don't think we should diminish the significance of uh, those people being in those positions because to your question, Petra, about emerging leaders, what we hear from um, our emerging leaders is that it is incredibly powerful for them. It's incredibly inspiring. They've never seen this before. When they think about a team leader, they think about a white person and suddenly they're seeing someone from their own country in that role. You can't be what you can't see. It is true. So... I think the role modelling is important and should be celebrated and it is a starting point that we need to leverage. Um, but I think in terms of the mindset and the um, ways of thinking of the emerging leaders, the local leaders that we're trying to support and encourage and facilitate, um, one of the things that I am seeing and hearing, and I, I want to quote my friend and colleague Jennifer Kalpakas here, who's not here, she might be listening on the live stream, but she talks about decolonizing the mind. And it's, in, it's an incredibly important concept for us to remember that 
people have been working in this system the way it is for decades. We're all shaped by it. We, whether we know it or not, we all have biases, conscious and unconscious, including local people who have been working in the system, conditioned to see themselves a certain way, see themselves as inferior in many ways. I think that we have to recognise that that's part of the shift that they have to reckon with within themselves and what Jennifer's words teach us is that that's a big part of their emergence as leaders, that that shift needs to happen with all of the other shifts that are going on. And, and so that's why, back to the framework that we, Penny and I spoke about, it is really personal as well as being organisational and systemic. It's really personal and all of us need to think about what it means for ourselves, how we see things, how we behave, how we treat others and how we look at things. Um, I think just in terms of the profitability, um, I don't think that it's more profitable either way to have a local or an international team leader. Maybe where there are contracts that are structured so that, you know, management fees paid on a person's salary, so the higher their salary, the more you, more you get paid on fees, that might be the case. But in general, I guess with the DFAT contracts that we're working with, these are generally reimbursable costs. I can't believe I'm talking about this at a, on a panel, but... <laughs> Anyone want to talk about contract reform? Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I'd be interested to know what, what you mean by that. I, I don't particularly see profitability being um, an issue. It's more about donor expectations driving the incentives of contractors and the choices that they make. Right, we have uh, time for perhaps one last question. Let's go. Sorry, up there. Does anyone else have a burning, absolutely burning question that you can't ask the... Right. That's the second last and then the last. The rest can probably ask during morning tea. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Carol. And I just wanted to um, uh, reflect on the word capacity. Um, I worked for several years and I've used the word, that word used loosely a lot of times, and but to me it's still not clear what it is that locals need to reach that level. So for me, it's almost condescending when, it's almost an assumption that locals always need their capacity built. So for me, there needs to be a clear you know, indication of what we mean by capacity for locals. Uh, and it, this leads to my second point, like you know, if, if, you, if where you say where an activity manager doesn't prioritize LLD and there's no resourcing for it, I think some of the practical solutions include just being, you know, just reframing it instead of saying, you know, let's not, if we don't have the money to invest in building someone's capacity, then saying, you know, offering incentives that would attract the best local talent rather than you picking someone that you need to build up. So I think it's looking and asking the question, what can I do to make my position more attractive for a local? Um, you know, the role itself, because sometimes locals know that sometimes they come into this job and they might do just administrative t kind of task and that's sort of almost degrading for someone who's qualified or even things like you know knowing that there's almost a dual economy within the MC system so that could pos possibly drive locals away as well um, knowing that it's not as competitive as with someone who's um, an international so just some reflections um, on that thank you Thank you. Erin um, Anderson from Inclusi. Um, just for the panel as we finish off, um, if you could all have one thing that would significantly shift the dial on locally led development, uh, what would it be? And, and we'll take a last question from Wilson and then that's it, please. <laughs> Good morning, I'm uh, Wilson from Balance of Power. Um, I've been listening with uh, big interest and in terms of how we bring forward the conversation on the locally led uh, and I think everyone are in different position as far as this conversation uh, is concerned when it comes to contractors the narrative is how it's being said is very different and I think if we start building advisors and consultants sitting in front the narrative will be different I think it's the conversation at times when it comes to locally led, sometimes it's more around losses, 
we might lose something and it takes our the conversation that way. But if it comes from the other and those of us who are implementing, it's an opportunity for us. It's a game. And I think if we are taking the conversation from that perspective, the conversation will be different. And I think it, every one of us are in, in different position as far as locally led is concerned. I mean, from us who are currently delivering the program, it's an opportunity where we can now be able to use our local context, the culture, the family, and even the language to be able to take everyone on the journey of the change that we wanted to do. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, we might be arguing, but all the conversation is very much on losses and gain. What are we losing? And I think some of the questions we are asking is, yeah, I like it, but I'll be losing something. You know, and I think we just have to be self-aware, you know, moving forward of that. I know from my end, it's an opportunity, it's a game. There's an opportunity now that we can have a voice in terms of how we want to see change happening in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson and Carol, for those reflections. Uh, so for Aaron, is that correct? From, uh, you had the, the, the point around one last thing that people are thinking of. Could I, could I use that question as a springboard for closing reflections as well? And then we'll close off the session. That's okay, we have four minutes. Huh? So one line conclusion from each panelist and a quick response to Aaron. <laughs> okay, fine. A response to Erin, and then we'll come around for, for one line. Thanks. Um, so in capacity, I, I agree with you. I think it's very vague. I, I grapple with it myself, and sometimes I, I ask myself, what is my capacity? What capacity building do I need to go through? And look, I've been on the, you know, we, we were all trying to build our own, um, you know, skills training, leadership, however way you want to frame it. So it's not capacity building. I think it's really singular if we see it as, a, as just capacity building of, of a certain um, groups or cohorts. I think the big question here is to ask the country that we go to, the people that we work with, what do they want and how can they, what, what are the systems and what are the approaches they feel would be the best solution to solve the, the development question that we have in hand. So I think oftentimes this is where we, we get really uh, thrown into the mix because we, we, we have to implement something in record time. In the first six months, we have to do a inception plan and you know, roll with it. And so we often don't take that time to reflect and to ask. These are really important questions to ask to have that meaningful engagement as well as um, you know, and contextualizing to, to the country and the program. Um, you asked about, um, you know, what do we, it's not like we should feel that the locals are coming with anything lacking. They're actually coming with a wealth of information that as managing contractors and as suppliers, we need to learn from you because it's you who will be leading the program. It's through you that achievements and results will be uh, achieved. So I think there is definitely a lot for us to learn in terms of how we communicate and sometimes how we approach. Um, that's definitely a big takeaway for all of us. But I, I would suggest that we need to maybe just take a little bit of a pause. I think we are always in this rush, rush to achieve and, ru and forget that we are not um, you know, having that meaningful conversation. Uh, I think my one thing and my final statement is the same thing. It is, it is urging you all to look at this yielding and wielding framework um, because I do think that we need to start with ourselves and then our organisations and we can all play a role in that. So I guess if we can all think about the power that we do have in the decisions we do get to make and think about locally led development within that context of what can you do uh, to use that power to shift the dial, even if it's just a little bit. Uh, that one point, right? So I will use a Martin Luther King uh, quote. 
the time is always right to do the right thing. So this is the time. We've got a mandate, we've got a policy, let's do it. And that's why we are here in solidarity. To, we're, we're here with an open, open arms and listening ear to listen and to meaningfully engage and do the right thing. Graham is first. Graham is first responding to Carol's question about capacity. And he says, this may be hugely controversial, but I don't think skills and competencies of national staff are the issue. As Joe said, we all have unconscious biases. I would possibly suggest that donors look for people that look like them, think like them, and have similar backgrounds. Um, and personally, this reminds me very much of the discussion in Australia around women in leadership and the question of merit. Um, then on one um, thing to shift um, uh, local, towards local development, uh, start modestly where there is no reason not to get nationals on um, managing contract selection, um, team selection, uh, look at the pay scales and performance reporting of technical assistance staff. And, sorry, next one. <laughs> on the final comment, if locally-led development is not a new topic, as Joe said, then why have we made so little progress? And Graham suggests that the answer is uh, to be found in thinking about incentives. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, each of the panelists for their participation. And maybe uh, I'd like to leave you with one, some, one thing to think about. I really liked what uh, um, James Badley said about uh, aid as a tool of statecraft versus locally led development. I think if we, if we shift away from that binary, it might be useful. Um, development programming, from my own experience and what I've seen with others who work, uh, other Pacific Islanders who uh, work in development, is actually a brilliant way of incubating nation building and national leadership. I mean, I'm already seeing that with a couple of colleagues who work on uh, Balance of Power, for example. They will hate this. But uh, uh, Mary Annie Rokotimba, for example, has participated in the review of the Great Council of Chiefs. Uh, Jennifer Kalpaka sits on the board of uh, BSP. So I think if you, if you begin to reframe locally led development as being more about nation building, you're actually supporting people who will be the leaders of tomorrow. And uh, Biman Prasadi from yesterday is an excellent example of this. So just that little thought to leave you with, instead of thinking about as the, the polarity or the binary of Aid, uh, aid as a tool of statecraft versus locally led development. How can we best support nation building and national leadership that will emerge through development programming? Thank you. Thank you.